It's rather ambiguous. The, the end is not quite the end. And the marking of the stages creates a very distinctive layering of space around a building. <clears throat> Issei is the main Shinto shrine. And its beginning, according to legend, was about 2,000 years ago <clears throat> when the emperor sent his daughter off to find where to put a sacred mirror related to the worship of Amaterasu, the great Kami of the sun. And I have a slightly different image of her in this time. So she's, she's the, the, the one on the left, and Toyuku, the one on the right, we're not going to look at anything of hers, but it's just to say that the shrine that we're going to is in fact in two parts. One is to Amaterasu, and the other one to Toyuku, and Toyuke was the, the goddess of agriculture. You can see the, the uh, grains of corn all around her vestments and the food that she's carrying, agriculture and produce and that sort of thing. So when this daughter of the emperor went looking around, at a certain place she apparently heard Amaterasu's voice saying, this is the place. In a forested area alongside a river called the Isuzu River, which is about 120 kilometers from Kyoto. Archaeology shows that in the third century, the Naika shrine, that's the one to Amaterasu, was established. And in the fifth, the nearby Geku shrine for Toyuke. And we're going to look, as I say, uh, first, uh, at, at, the, at the first one, Soli, which was built in its present form in 692. And it has been built, as perhaps some of you know, every 20 years since, brand new again, exactly the same as the, as the previous one, which is rather an amazing celebration, I think, of the whole idea of the cycles of nature, that this shrine gets renewed year after year after year, and I think... We're, we're into the 60-somethieth 60 60 <laughs> um, uh, generation now. As we've seen in Shinto, a paramount, paramount idea is purification. And here we're going to see it in action in a number of ways. That's the Isuzu River. So, this is the first step where you cross a sacred bridge. And at the beginning of this bridge, and at the end, and, the, and you can see the end in the left-hand slide, there's the Torii, Torii Gate, T-O-R-I-I, -I, Gate, which is the sign of a Shinto shrine, and it marks your passing from the space of every day into a sacred space. Um, in the right-hand slide, you can see people stroking that um, cap on a post of the bridge, brass cap or bronze cap, um, and you can see it's actually shiny from the stroking, and that is because it is a sacred bridge. If you look in the river and the stony bank, uh, you can see that it's not just randomly made. It's almost as if every stone has been put carefully in place. So, which shows that the, 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 the place has been made with purpose beyond its simple function. So the whole area is the shrine, not just the buildings. And then alongside the bridge are these posts with struts and little roof-like caps, uh, which mark out the site for the bridge in the next cycle. Soon you're at a shelter, which is called the Temizusha, and here there's a continuous little fountain and ladles with which to purify yourself by washing out your mouth or wetting your hands and wetting your hands. In fact, a, a foreigners usually make fools of themselves by using it to drink. Alternatively, you can go down to the river uh, for the same function, a purifying function. 
Now you can see again that there are quite a lot of people around and it's, it's believed in the Edo period, which is the 17th to the 19th century, it was estimated that 10% of the Japanese population made a pilgrimage here every year. And uh, the, 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 the two times that I've been there, it's been really very full of people. <clears throat> the second main stage along a long gravel path through the forest has that sense of pilgrimage. And there are numerous events along the way. So firstly, there's another Tori gate. And you can see that, uh, on, you can just see two women quite close to the gate are, have paused and are praying before they move through from the one side to the other. And in fact, a lot of them pray on this side of the gate and then on the other side of the gate. As you move along, you become aware of various shrines. For a start, these great big cryptomeria trees, which are Japanese cedars, are wrapped, partly to protect them from people who want to stroke them with reverence, and partly to show that they are sacred. And there are people stroking them. Uh, you can see the woman on the left hugging them, and you can see the effect of all that hugging and stroking over the years. And it's quite a moving thing, in fact, to see somebody treating a, a, a tree like a granddaughter or something like that. This wrapping or binding, which they call Shiminawa, is a very ancient custom. Uh, it comes out of the very earliest ways of marking occupation of the land with the binding of reeds which became associated with all different kinds of rituals. <clears throat> and it, in time, it came to denote sanctification. So here, in this photograph on the left-hand side, it's in the Fushimi Shrine, and you can see that in both shrines, there's a piece of rope that's <laughs> tied across, which represents that idea. Rope, and then it's got these sort of uh, rice fiber tassels that hang below it and also that zigzag paper, paper element. And then <clears throat> on the right hand side again there's a tree in the, at the Nikko shrine which is clearly a sacred tree also denoted by this rope and tassels and things. At Nikko, I mean at Issei uh, on your journey, you pass all kinds of shrines, tiny little ones like the, uh, the, the, the little spring on the top left-hand side. On the top right-hand side, there's a bunch of really quite nondescript stones, um, which, which in fact is a tiny shrine, and you can see that from the rope and the tassels. And then there's a sacred stable, which houses the horse, <coughs> And, and it too has got, on, on each of those posts, it's got these little tassels and things d denoting that. Um, bottom right-hand corner, p people seem to use a lot of these shrines to kind of demonstrate their, and perhaps bless their weddings in. So here's a wedding group going along, and I, I don't know whether this is accurate to say that uh, her binding, she's bound all around the bride, and I wonder whether her binding also means this idea of her sanctification. As you go along, you pass other shed-like structures which are used in ceremonies, um, more sacred trees, glimpses of shrines, other smaller shrines through the, tr through the trees, and then larger structures which relate to the pilgrimage, like spaces for monks to prepare and also for, for a ceremonial dancing. Now you become aware of this beautifully made fence, wooden fence. And then finally you're there. There's this flight of steps. So you rise from one plane of existence to another. And there, there's another Torrey gate through a fence. But you're still not there when you get there. 
You stand before another kind of gatehouse, and here, in fact, as an ordinary person, you can go no further, because there are three more fences before you could get to the inner sanctum of the great shrine. And in fact, only high priests and members of the royal family can get through to that. So you can wait and pray at this gate. You can actually see the gate through the Tori gate. You can wait there and pray there and hope that one of its white silk curtains which hang there will blow aside a little in the breeze so you can catch a glimpse of the perfection inside. It is something like perfection, and one can see it on the right-hand side. And many people, including the man who initiated the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, and also Kenzo Tangi, who's a, a great Japanese architect, who's, some of whose work we're going to see, um, compared it with the, with the perfection of the Parthenon in Athens. And really what they're saying there is that what the Parthenon achieved in stone the Issei Shrine achieved in wood and thatch. But you can never actually get to see that one, not from close up. But fortunately, there are smaller shrines, which are not shut off, which are modeled on the main one, so you can get a very good idea. And this one, the Kazahinomi Shrine, is one of those, and you glimpse it through the forest and then you must make a small journey to reach it through the Torii gates across another sacred bridge. You can see that it has firstly on, on the right there an empty platform of white ground, white gravel, which is the site for the next generation shrine. And note that the little rope and tassels denote it as a sacred ground. And then there are four components in the shrine. The Torii gate, and there's a kind of a, 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 a gatehouse shelter at which you stand and, and say your prayers, make your offerings. There's a fence, and then there's the, the shrine itself, the shrine building itself. What's not visible is that the shrine building stands on posts uh, above the floor, with, with the floor above the ground. It has this very heavy but beautifully shaped and refined thatched roof with a number of distinctive features. The rafters protruding something like scissors, scissors above the roof. And there are gilded logs they call katsogi, which run along the ridge. We'll see some more of them in a minute. Um, and then there are other structural pieces that project out of the end. <clears throat> and then there are these large round columns and beautifully made wooden walls between them. The origin of this is, is quite interesting. Um, the very early houses of, of Japan look something like these. When I say early, the yayo, they're called the Yayoi period, which is between 300 BC and 300 AD. They looked a bit like this. <clears throat> now, the earliest... Um, inhabitants of Japan were in fact hunter-gatherers and then there was a big migration from mainland China somewhere between 300 BC and 300 AD uh, which brought three things that became very central to Japanese culture and the first was rice which it hadn't had before and together with that was uh, social hierarchy and also metalworking in bronze and iron <clears throat> The rice growing obviously produced a surplus which was necessary to enable an elementary urban settlement to happen. And its successful planting and harvesting were clearly essential to people's lives. So it was around storehouses, in fact, and granaries that uh, ceremonies were held at regular intervals. And in time, the buildings were attributed a certain sanctity. So when it came to designing a building for sacred purpose, that was the form that it took. And you can see on the right-hand bottom slide the, 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 the granary, and on the left, another of the smaller shrines in the Issei area.
that again is a, a photograph of the, uh, the main shrine before it's, uh, uh, behind its beautiful wall. <clears throat> Back to our idea of the journey. We've been through three main stages, entry and purification, the way through the forest with intermittent stops at small shrines and ceremonial buildings, and the arrival in prayer space. We've passed through a number of layers and gates on the way and finally cannot penetrate the last four fences to the precious goal. But we've noted that all the smaller shrines too have fences and some were made in a way that implies a sacred binding or wrapping. All traditional buildings are wrapped in a number of, la a number of layers in this way. And the idea is expressed by the word oku, which for Hiko Maki, who is another contemporary Japanese architect uh, whose work we will look at, considers to be the core idea in Japanese space making. Oku implies a deep, multi-layered, setrepetal space. In other words, moving inwards. So that's the way things are organized, to, through a whole series of layers, moving inwards towards some sort of secret center. So the word okuyuki describes an impression of distance in space. And an ukujima is a remote shrine outside, <coughs> outside a village. So it implies this gradual movement through a series of distinct layers towards a secret and, secret and or divine place. The stages are not exactly obstacles, but you are required to penetrate them in order to reach the heart. Now, in the urban environment, the most obvious sign of this is walls with gateways. When I say the urban environment, the urban environment that still shows signs of, of, of traditional building. And here you can see these large walls sheltered by their roofs, punctured by gateways. And gateways go into temples or to uh, palaces or to houses. And they're the start of, of at least four layers. And if we look at the Bukoji temple on the top, so there's the first layer. And then the second is purification, that's the number one. And then there's this space that you have to move across and, and up the stairs of the veranda, and then you're onto the veranda, and finally you go into the inside core of the place. Even in double-story houses right on the street, the gateway transition is there in a kind of compressed way. So the first place you enter is a purification one where you wash your hands and change your clothing, take off your shoes, and it's expressed in this very densely layered screens onto the street, even in shops. And these create this very private, opaque face to the street in which visual contact between the inside and out is through, through these screens occurs in momentary glimpses. Now we've glimpsed already a, a, a shrine through the forest and the, the idea kirara, the glimpse, is a very important idea in Japanese culture. We have glimpsed the shrine in the forest, we might have glimpsed the, the, the grand shrine through the white silk curtains. Uh, and this is associated also with the, with the idea of the haiku, which is aimed to surprise you to a momentary glimpse of a higher reality. This depth at the edge of the house begins a series. There's a, the, kind of spe, the kind of view that you might get a glimpse of somebody passing by in the street. So this depth at the edge of the house begins a series of subtle stages to the core. Here you can see, the, again, that kind of thickness and opacity of uh, um, uh, privacy of the outside of the houses that goes through a series of layers into the core of the house, which is at the tokonoma that we talked a little about yesterday, the little shrine for family prayers. Now, if gateways are a big feature, so too are thresholds connected to them. Uh, they are given very special attention 
to ensure that the layer is something that you experience with your feet so that you can sense the passing from one world to another. And here in this first one, you go up one, two steps, three steps, and the surface changes. And here are the three wonderful variations of thresholds. If you just look at the one on the right-hand side, uh, there's one huge piece of stone flat, flattened out on the top, which marks the transition from one world to another, and then this softly cobbled layer around it in a little step. And below it, a kind of tiny chasm between moving and entering. And in fact, that enters to a shrine called the um, Dyson Inn, which is one of the great Zen shrines. Uh, a small step out of a kitchen door, but what a poetic one. <laughs> Lastly, the connection between inside and out is mediated by a whole series of layers, fences, or whatever you like to call them, shoji screens on the right-hand side, the shutters, the inner veranda, the outer veranda, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers before you get to the garden. And the garden itself is a layer between the house and the outside world. It's as if the ideas of binding and fencing and journey all come together in a kind of a rich intertidal zone at the edge of the building. <coughs> It shows that a little bit from a slightly different view. And there you have it in detail. And I think I mentioned to you yesterday that things in nature are seen as sacred and perfect. If you just look at this, the way stones have been chosen and the way it's all been put together in the right-hand slide there, it is almost as if every little stone is sacred. Now, if we're going back to Issei. <clears throat> and if you look at the plan of your journey, there's very little indication of it being uh, planned as a whole. Rather, it seems to be made simply in relation to where um, the sacred spots are in this piece of land and also the shape of the land itself and the forest. But the final enclosure, and you can see it right at the top, the inner precinct there, is in fact... Um, a completely symmetrical thing, so it's, it's, it's obviously planned as a totality. And there's another picture of it. You can see it's laid out in an almost uh, perfectly symmetrical way. So it's a bit like a daisy bush, I think. The parts, the flowers are perfect, but their arrangement on the bush is, is organic. The other thing, in fact, to note about the shrine, which you probably can't quite see in here, is that, in fact, the final gate is just slightly off the axis so that you don't enable that perfection to be uh, something that's part of the world but something that's a, part of a, a, a different world. <clears throat> right, in 552 through very close contact with China, Buddhism arrived in Japan with, together with a large number of Chinese builders and craftspeople. Many other Chinese things, from dress to philosophy, came too. Most significantly, the calendar, the model for writing, and the notion of the complete supremacy of the ruler. And the person who championed these things, Chinese, most fervently was Prince Shotoku, now, he was a very sensitive and sophisticated intellectual and built an education-orientated temple complex outside Nara, the then capital, which still remains. The Horiyuji uh, precinct is completely different from Issei. It's not organic at all. It's very distinctly conceived as a totality, as you can see in the left-hand picture and systematically designed on a long axis that stretch, stretches right down into, into the countryside. 
So if you start at the beginning of the arrow, you go along this very long avenue and uh, with the walls on each side, and then you can see a gate. You go through that gate along another, another avenue, up to the main gate, and then right at the top of the picture, you're in the, you're in the main enclosure. And on the right-hand side, you can see the first stage of the journey on the, on the, on the top, and now you're approaching, oh no, you're looking back at the gate in the second one. <clears throat> You've passed through the gate and you're moving towards the enclosure, which is lined with these large walls and punctured by gates to minor shrines and other buildings. Then you go up three or four flights of steps to a gateway up at the top, it's a very controlled approach, and it's a bit intimidating if you look at the scale and length of it. But for one factor, and that is the kind of asymmetry in the way that the buildings at the end are arranged. At the top of the step, there's this what's called the Chumon Gateway, which is two stories high, and it cuts through a large fence, which you can see on the left-hand side there, which is in the form of, of a kind of cloister, which goes around the large flat enclosure that we're going to look into in a minute. And that, that gateway is guarded by, as they often are these gateways, guarded by these two guardian deities of the Buddha who keep off evil spirits. They were carved in wood in 711. So they're really old. And it's quite interesting to look at them because if you look at the one on the left, he's got his mouth slightly open and the one on the right is slightly closed. So it's saying, ah, um. And those are the first and last sounds of the Sanskrit uh, uh, phonetic system and express, it said, the whole breadth of, of Buddha's teaching. Inside, you find yourself on a direct line to a hall at the end. The pagoda's on the left. And, uh, and on the other side, there's what's called the condo, which is another kind of a hall building. So you've been through rather a severe journey, but there are some sort of mitigating factors. Firstly, there's this wonderful feeling of tranquility, all those horizontals parallel with the earth. And the hall at the end, the, con the condo, has this generous breadth and scale and doesn't dominate. In fact, it's not even the main building. It's a teaching space. The main shrine is the conduit opposite the pagoda. And then there's a very subtle relationship of these two buildings, the pagoda and the, uh, the conduit. The pagoda is slightly further from the axis than the conduit, creating a very gentle balance. And then there's the sheer grace and beauty of the buildings. They're all 7th century buildings, the oldest timber buildings in the world. Finally, there's the cloister with its softly shaped columns, generous breadth, elegant and permeable, uh, permeable screens, and knuckly timber construction. It shades you and creates a sense of calm enclosure. It's very interesting to me because the, you can see that slight bulging in the columns. It's very similar to what's called entesis in the classical Greek columns, where they're slightly bulged so that, so that they, they look as if they're firmly carrying their loads and give some representation of the load. <clears throat> the buildings seem to Lawrence van der Post, who went there, not like things built from the ground up, but like something alighted from the sky, he said, like the wings of great birds folding as they found their nests. It's rather a lovely image. And if you walk around them, they seem to whirl gently around you. Now, what I find particularly interesting about the journey that you've been through is that despite its clarity and rigor, it doesn't seem to end decisively in an object or a center, but rather in a place without a proper center, one which has a certain ambiguity or open-endedness. And the curtains in that hall that's at the end seem to add softness to the place 
and give it a sense of mystery and you get these glimpses as the curtains blow of the sacred spaces inside that hall. It's quite interesting to see actually also if you're thinking about how it works with nature, how transparent even a big building like that is that you can see right through it. So nature really flows up and into it and right through it and out the other side. The pagoda is a particularly fine one with its roofs that taper from the top six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, in that mathematical proportions. It's as high as a ten-story building, and it has in its core, and resting on a great big foundation, where sacred relics are buried, a mighty tree trunk, which you can see on the left-hand side in the section. And the most up-to-date technology of dating shows that the tree was felled in 592. <laughs> That's a long time ago for that tree to be there. <coughs> Todaiji is also at Nara <clears throat> and it's been bent down, burnt down a number of times but it was built originally in 752. Buddhism had been adapt, uh, adopted as a state religion and there's nothing at all equivocal about this journey or its ending. You can see it in the top drawing where a long axial avenue goes through two enormous pagodas and these pagodas were 100 meters high. Incidentally, at this stage, Nara in this place, it, it had a population of 200,000 people. It was quite a big city and apparently there were 50 pagodas can you imagine what it would have been like um, in the city? The drawing below shows it when, when those pagodas were burnt down and these, a lot of these buildings were constantly burnt down either by mistakes or, or conflict. Uh, but then they were replaced. So it shows it, uh, the bottom one shows it without the, those two, two pagodas and also, also shows the proportions of the, the main enclosure that you go into a bit more accurately. It's all at a huge scale. So this is the first gate which is called the Nandaimon gate which is the south gate and it's this huge threshold that you have to climb up and through and it's really at a very big scale. If you look at the size of those tree trunks related to the people, you can get some idea of, the, of how large it is. And then these massive columns go up and a, a crisscrossing of big beams and then the bracketing. Um, and the bracketing really is one of the main areas where you differentiate one period in Japanese architecture from another, is the, the way that the bracketing is made. These, these have got what they call a, a cloud uh, formation bra bracketing and you can see they've got a slightly cl cloud-like look about them. <clears throat> now you have a view, having gone through that Nandaimon gate, you have a view of, of the next passage of this avenue that takes you to the next gate and then rearing up behind you can see the main temple. And now you're in that enclosure looking at the main temple and you can see how it's huge. Until recently it was the biggest wooden structure in the world and this version which was built after a fire in about 1700 is actually only two-thirds of the original size. It's amazing as a feat of construction you get again some idea of the size of it here. I think that the uh, overhang here is eight meters, or eight, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's eight meters. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredible uh, feat of construction. And there's no doubt that it, it was built like that to represent the power authority, and authority of the Buddhist imperial state. It's really designed to impress you and make you feel small. And unlike the previous shrines that we've looked at, it's a pretty emphatic end to the journey. Now, inside is this incredible Buddha um, who is over 15 meters high. 
And were it not for the fact that um, the Buddha was there, um, I, I, the, the, this whole process would be really rather overwhelming. But the Buddha itself, I mean, the size of the Buddha, to give you some idea how big it is, uh, the, the head is three people high, it's, it's five meters high, so it's nearly three people standing on top of each other. But despite its size, it's got such a benign expression, and it's surrounded by this gilded halo of, um, of, other, of other Buddhas, and by lotus flowers, and, and then there, there are other, there we, there are the other Buddhas, and, and then there are these other personages around as well. There's a, a guardian deity, and there's another uh, body, bodhisattva. In fact, it's the same one as w the, the, where we saw that group of a thousand Buddhas, the goddess of mercy, who's there. If it weren't for that, uh, the, it, it would be, a, I think, a very oppressive journey that you would have to make the benignness that there is in that. There's a, a researcher called Gunter Nitschke who's done a lot of work on Japanese um, uh, space making and, uh, in, in architecture and urbanism. And he called these Nara shrines um, and, and also the, the, the plans of cities that were made at the moment at the same time he called it simply geometric order which was to differentiate it from the uh, rather sort of uh, 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 un unconscious uh, organic order of the earlier work. And uh, he said it was in which man seeks to impose an intellectual concept of order on nature. And it's, it's absolutely true that this is what's happening, but that doesn't state that the impression, the intention behind it, which was clearly to express this all-powerful religious and political order. This was the early days of Buddhism, and it was claiming its space in Japan before it kind of settled in with Shinto. <clears throat> you would think that Iyasu Tokugawa, the great shogun who kicked the foreigners out of Japan, unified the nation, and whose dynasty lasted over 200 years until 1868, would have had the most dominating and centralized shrine. You wouldn't mess with him, would you? In fact, he himself wanted it to be very modest. It was his grandson who lavished huge funds on making it an impressive place. But interestingly, he arranged it in a very sophisticated journey up a mountain. Certainly not modest, but not overbear overbearing either rather related very sensitively to the forested mountainside, which, and it's, it's near a small town of Nikko, north of Tokyo. It's about three or four hours by train out of Tokyo. Actually, there are two shrines, or a, a group of shrines, and we, we're going to visit the one that you can see Toshogo related to. The starting point for all, from, uh, for all of them, as at Issei, is a sacred bridge over a rushing river. And if you just follow it in the, in the plan, uh, from the bridge at A, you go into this broad way at B, you come to a kind of central a knuckle kind of space at C, where, which is where uh, you can connect across to the other shrines. And from C, you go straight up, and then you do a little zigzag until finally you come straight up to the shrine uh, in front of you. So we're going we're gonna to do that walk now. So this is that great way that you get into that goes up to the top, and you can see, again, the Torii Gate with its, ta with its uh, rope and tassels. Um, this is one of the long... Uh, ways that connects to the other shrines and it's kind of cut into the ground so that when you're there you feel yourself very much in the earth and then it's lined with these um, uh, stone lanterns. Uh, you come to the, a meeting place where the, the, those two, the, the big way up the mountain, the big way along the contour come together 
another big Tory gate, a pagoda, and another gate, which we'll see in a minute. Here is the other gate now moving up. You move up and through that gate, and you also, you can see, go through a fence, a stone fence that runs along, and in a sense, a kind of big fence of these huge, big trees. The gateway's got protective lines that are in it. You can see it's pouring with rain. You come along a path next to this wide gravel patch, and along it, there are buildings very highly decorated that hold uh, all sorts of sacred ceremonial robes and things. <clears throat> now, what we're going to look at now is generally viewed by Western commentators to demonstrate a severe fall and loss of taste because unlike everything we've been looking at and what is considered to be the particular Japanese tradition, um, disappears. It's very, very fully and richly decorated. I enjoy it for three reasons. It shows, firstly, just how dangerous it is to stereotype natural, uh, national characteristics, and that the Japanese aesthetic, like that of everyone else, stretches across a wide range of human sensibility. Secondly, it's made and you, I hope you'll agree with me as we go through it, with such consistency as to constitute a whole, very coherent work. And thirdly, I enjoy it, because the journey with all its twists and turns, its terraces and stairs, and all the buildings that line it, is handled with such harmony with the forest and, se and sensitivity with the land. So from the place of the pagoda, we move up, uh, onto the uh, terrace. We've passed the uh, tre treasuries and the store places for, uh, for ceremonial robes. On the other side of the, um, of the pathway, there's a, a stable uh, for sacred horses. And uh, it's got a frieze of monkeys. Now, monkeys, it's believed um, traditionally, uh, are, are protections for horses. You can see it's the original um, uh, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil uh, idea. Uh, we pass in the, on that same sequence a purification place, a library, um, a, a whole series of stone lanterns, each one a little bit different from the one next door. And you can see how you, the, the forest is very clear, but it's uh, or, or very uh, uh, onto you, but it's also walled off. And then from this terrace, we move up to the next terrace. And here we go up it, with a bell tower on the one side and a, a drum tower on the other. And then you're in this kind of space, and the density and intensity of building and of elaboration and decoration increases. And you're on this narrow terrace uh, with this enclosing cloister on, on, on your left-hand side, which you can see is very, very richly uh, decorated. Just look at the beautiful creatures that it's decorated with. It's amazing this stuff is all, it's all as if it was done yesterday. So when something breaks in Japan, they just fix it. <laughs> they keep on fixing it year after year after year in, in a shrine like this. So it's, it's actually perfect just as, as it was built. Now we're going to move up to another level <clears throat> through what's called the Neoman Gate which is absolutely dripping with stories of sages and mythical creatures. It's not a very a good photograph because it's so wet, but here you can see from close up how richly decorated it is. You can see there are these mythical lines at one level and then behind it these little kind of cameos um, which apparently relate to um, uh, traditional myths and so on that are built in there, and then the incredibly richly decorated uh, con pieces of construction, the, the corbeling. Mm. 
Now you threw into the final sacred enclosure, the main terrace, and from here you can get glimpses if you get closer into the interiors of m many of these spaces where, where you have um, uh, uh, there's a lot of them are storehouses with, with vermilion lacquered in, um, columns and shelves of offerings of sake. Sake is the uh, Japanese wine for the kami. Now, just like in Horyuji, the goal of the journey is not a distinctive dominant building, but rather a place composed of several buildings. There is a main hall, the Honden, within, within the enclosure. Let's just get to it. which has this incredibly elaborate uh, gateway that goes into it. Those last four photographs are all in the same space. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, so there is this main hall, but again, it, it doesn't force itself on you. It's not like a thing that you're going to go to. It's, it's merely part of a, of a group of buildings that surround you. Now, I find this a fascinating and absorbing journey that you have to make, because Despite the brilliance and extravagance of the, of the decoration, I found the atmosphere very timeless and serious. And the decorative encrustation to me seemed to be simply another layer. We've been talking about layers. I think this is another layer. And while, at Ise, while Ise spoke of the modesty and simple beauty of nature and human life, Nico speaks of its glorious abundance. Nico also shows something you find in many shrine and temple sites, which is only suggested at Ise and Horyuji, and that is when you're at the end, you find it's not the end. There's a way out of this upper place. You go up above the roofs of the buildings, and you find yourself on this path, very deeply cut into the earth, uh, so you feel so close to the trees and in the body of Mother Nature. And then the pathway turns into a great stairway which takes you right up to Iyasu's, in fact, very modest tomb. And it's on the right-hand side and just in front of it, I somehow didn't get a photograph with both these things in it. It's on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side are these two symbols. <clears throat> the stalk, which is symbolic of humankind's capacity to reach great heights of spiritual existence, and the turtle, which is symbolic of the capacity to penetrate great depths. Now, if you think of the open-endedness of the end of the journeys at Issei, Horyuji, and Nikko, and also what we saw yesterday at Kiyomizu Dira, where when you got to the main hall at the top, you found that you, it actually carried on through the forest. And the first slide that I had on here to start the whole thing off was in fact the end of the journey at um, Kiyomizu Dira. Just went into the forest and up to the top of the mountain, all sorts of little shrines all the way along it. I think you'll, rec you'll recognize that that journey represents the Buddhist concept of life as not having an end, but it repeating again and again and again. So that's all for today. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions. Sorry? Yeah? It's painted wood. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It must cost a fortune. It, I mean, it, uh, it's, uh, I can't remember how many people worked on it in the beginning. They, they know how many people. It's like hundreds of thousands of people worked on it. It was built incredibly quickly, apparently. Like in 30 years or something, they built this whole place. And there were literally hundreds of thousands of people who worked on it. And it, it almost bankrupted them when they built it. 
And I'm, I'm sure you're right that every year it must cost a fortune to, to keep it going uh, at, the, at that level of quality and finish. You, the one thing about it is these huge roofs, you know, even uh, like over, the, over that wall, that sort of cloister wall, which was very fully decorated, uh, they've all got these big roofs over them. So that they get, that it's very, they're very well sheltered from the rain because the rain there just falls down like that. So if you've got an umbrella, it's very easy to walk around. You could see there, when we were there, there were thousands of people, literally thousands of people walking up and down. It, was, it poured with rain the whole day, but it all falls vertically, which is, and it's quite warm. So, so I think that the, the, the buildings work in that way very well from, from that maintenance point of view. The, the big trees. Oh, no. I think that because it's protected by the stuff around it, it just hasn't weathered. It's, it's, it's one of those uh, Japanese cedars. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, it is structural. I mean, it basically, there's, it's, it's, it's got a big foundation at the bottom. It sits on a big rock, and under the rock, there's, there, these remains are buried. And then it's got this, a sort of slight scaffolding around it that obviously braces it and, and enables the cantilever of the roofs. But it's amazing that that place has, you know, has stood for so long. Yeah? What is the significance of the color red of the building? The, sure. Um, that sort of a million color. It, it, it is a very, it's a very important Buddhist uh, uh, color. Uh, and and I, I can't quite get in, uh, quickly in my head what, ex what it represents. What is it? Pardon? Is it because of what it is? Uh, what is the looking forward to? And I was wondering if there's something different. Well, the Shinto shrines also use that color. Yeah. So I'll, I'll see if I can check on that overnight. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to look at those tomorrow, actually. So I'd, I'd rather not go into that now. But I think as, uh, quite a lot of these photos were taken from those. In fact, that 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 whole layering thing around the edge of around the edge of the buildings. A lot of them come from those. Uh, th those Zen, those Zen garden shrines, and 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 they are very very layered. And and the from the building you get that layering, you get the garden, you get a wall, and then you get trees that are slightly tended and a bit further away, they're a bit less tended and a bit less, and then eventually you get the world out there, you know, which is not looked after. So it's very much creating a sort of graded uh, a, a continuity between the inside of the building and. The mountains in the distance. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, how do these areas integrate with the city or the surrounds? Uh, is there anything nearby? Yeah. In, um, <clears throat> I mean, the, 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 you know, it's all changed over time, so it's a little bit different now from the way that it was, but the, those two sites in Nara, that was the Horyuji and the, um, uh, the Todaiji sites, they're actually more or less in the city, and in fact, uh, if you look at a, uh, the, an old plan of the city, I showed the plan of uh, Kyoto, um, but Nara was very similar to that. It was a very rigorous um, subdivision in, uh, you know, a, a rectilinear subdivision, and and those shrines were very much into, built into that configuration. Uh, so they would be attached to one of the great avenues that goes down. Yeah, that, that's, that's the way that they would have been integrated into the environment, yeah. Now it's, it's all changed a little bit, but, you know, they are still, uh, you know, on, you, 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 you arrive there along big roads and that, that work on the same grid, in fact, that, that was uh, built all those years ago. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, once, once you get into, into the city, 
nature gets more controlled. The, the Tadaji, uh, that, that huge big one, in fact, sits in a big park, um, uh, which is part of the old imperial kind of park. It's a deer park, and uh, you can play with a sacred deer <laughs> if you want to. So it's, 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 in, this, it's in this great big park. So, uh, so, so I mean, th th those, that's also obviously... Uh, 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 like a connection between the nature out there and, and the buildings. But I think a lot of those shrines were simply in the building. And the other smaller shrines, the Bukoji one that I showed you, for instance, is, it's like a very enclosed, built-in place in the middle of the city. It's like an urban shrine. So that some of the shrines are right in the middle of the city and others are on the edge, still connected with nature. And I, I suspect it's always been like that. Yeah. Yeah, tropical. Yeah. Um, the the I've I've got I've got ones from years ago, which was in August, and then the more recent ones uh, I've been there in um, yeah, uh, September and October. So t t t Oh, this one, yeah, this one, well, the one on the right I actually got out of uh, the, the, the net. But the one on the left I, I took, and that was when we were here recently, which was in May. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's an amazing climate because it's tropical and it's also, you have snow. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.